All right, welcome to this video on Management and Leadership Basics. We're going to be talking about job stress in this section. So today's learning objectives will be to define selected components of job stress. So we're going to focus on role ambiguity, role stress, perceived fit, and uh, job satisfaction. We want to describe why high levels of job stress are detrimental for a workplace. And then we want to identify evidence-based strategies managers can try to reduce job stress for their employees. Let's begin with background on job stress. The first two items I'm going to talk about are closely related and often overlapping. The first is called role ambiguity. This refers to a situation where an employee just isn't clear about a specific job or task. Sometimes this is due to a lack of information or poor instructions from the supervisor, but it can also be as simple as the employee didn't understand the instructions. Role conflict arises when multiple employee expectations pull the person in different directions. It's so like forcing an employee to make a choice where it seems impossible to meet all the expectations at a high level. So let's think about a typical retail pharmacy. Many employees find that the expectations to fill prescriptions in less than 10 or 15 minutes and the expectation to provide high level customer service may at times be in conflict. Additionally, you could think about a pharmacist being interrupted while they're working on a prescription for the first customer. They just get interrupted by a second customer who's just asking where they can find an over-the-counter heartburn medication. It can create this sort of conflict while the pharmacist is striving to meet both role expectations. Think about a time where you were assigned a task at work but felt like the directions or expected outcomes were unclear. What did you do? How did you respond? Did the ambiguity in your task cause you to feel uneasy, nervous, or anxious that you wouldn't do a good job? Now consider you're the boss with 10 different employees. How might you interpret a situation where two of your employees seem more anxious about a task? This could be a situation where a brief meeting with the two worried employees might identify the points of that role ambiguity and maybe hopefully reach a point where you can reduce confusion around a task and really help put them at ease. The task itself may still be difficult, but the clarity around the task reduces unnecessary stress. Now let's take a deeper dive at expectations for employees and let's talk about work email at home. So should employees check email outside of work? Researchers at Virginia Tech uh, might say otherwise. In 2018, they did a study evaluating employer expectations regarding email. So employees felt an obligation to work during non-work time. So again, thinking about going home maybe after the typical 9 to 5 workday, uh, and you're receiving emails all hours of the night and feeling that obligation that they have to respond to those emails. The researchers found that not only did it have a negative impact on the employee, but it also had an impact on the employee's spouse. So when we think about having this, you know, work time, non-work time, um, you know, we're in this 24-7 kind of society where we're always plugged in, we're always checking our phone, always checking our alerts. Um, we have to think sometimes how, um, what type of expectations you're setting for your employees and how those expectations may cause additional stress. Now let's dive into role stress itself. Now the lack of clarity around a role or the conflicts that arise from multiple expectations that we spoke about before creates this role stress. Now role stress is inevitable in any job to some degree, but higher levels of role stress can cause an employee to become frustrated with their job. And as that frustration builds, an employee is at risk of burning out, essentially hitting a breaking point where they have had, they've just had enough of the stress. And that breaking point is where we see something like turnover. So this is where the employee actually quits his or her job and the employer is now forced to rehire for the position. The next component of job stress relates to the fit between the employee and the employer. So researchers refer to this as person organization fit or PO fit. People like to work for companies that meet their professional needs. Maybe it's pay, status, recognition, achievement, promotion opportunities, for example. Companies like to hire people that work to achieve the company's mission. Now, when one side doesn't like how the other side is performing, this PO relationship suffers, ultimately leading to a break. And that break meaning like the employee either quits or the organization may 
fire the employee. Now let's take a deeper dive into another example, workplace wellness, and specifically workplace wellness programs. How great are workplace wellness programs for employees? Have you ever seen a company that said, you know, part of your insurance or package that you get to uh, enroll in this program and maybe they've got things like diet, nutrition, setting you up with a primary care physician, uh, maybe some comprehensive program, gym membership discounts, whatever it may be. So uh, investigators actually wanted to take a look to see what type of impact these workplace wellness programs had on employees. In a recent cluster randomized trial with about 32,000 employees, researchers found that there were positive effects of these workplace wellness programs on self-reported behavior. So things like, you know, were you exercising more? Um, did you seek out your uh, seek out a primary care physician? So, so that's good, right? You see some of these positive effects. But one of the things that the trial also found was that there was no effect on actual health, healthcare spending or employment outcomes at 18 months. So thinking, okay, you know, the wellness program, if the employer is hoping that they're going to reduce insurance cost or um, reduce the amount of turnover or job stress and some of those things, like it actually, they saw no difference. So um, when we think about workplace wellness programs, there may be some benefits, uh, but maybe we have to just be careful to think that they're an end-all, be-all solution for, um, for things like job stress. So why does all this matter? And what do you think? You know, we have different factors we talk about, like uh, role ambiguity, role conflict, job stress, person organization fit. Um, in today's, in this lecture, we, we're not talking about job motivators or job hygienes, but we'll get into that in another video. But how do these factors have an impact on things like your job satisfaction, maybe the actions that an employee takes, whether they uh, want to quit that job or stay, um, whether when they stay, do they work hard or do they, um, you know, kind of mail it in a little bit? Um, and then what's the loyalty to the organization? You know, when, when the organization suffers, uh, are employees quick to leave or are they going to stick around? Uh, and, and these, we think of these as kind of like surrogate measures, uh, things on the pathway to outcomes that we often measure, um, you know, we measure quarterly or annually or whatever it may be, things like turnover, um, uh, productivity, so just other, you know, customer service, like how, how well are we actually serving our customers? So when we, you know, we put employees through high levels of stress and their job satisfaction were to go down, you know, what might that do to turnover? So we might think that, okay, if their job satisfaction drops, are they more likely to leave the job? Are they more likely to provide poor service to your customers? Um, is their productivity going to go down? You know, so like, so thinking about that, that's sort of how we're trying to understand, you know, what, what all this has, uh, what, what all of these things have to do with um, your, your end result that you're trying to achieve for your, for your organization. So this is where we'll lead into some active learning. So uh, if you're enrolled in the class, um, we'll have you read uh, this paper uh, by Kather and colleagues. We're going to talk about um, pharmacist job stress and the role of organizational, extra role, and individual factors on work-related outcomes. So basically, you'll read this paper. It's about 13 pages, so it should take you about 25 to 30 minutes to read the paper, uh, and then take a short quiz related to the paper. Um, if you're not enrolled in the class, uh, I highly recommend you check out, um, again, and I'll leave this up on the screen for a second, but this is written by Carolyn Gaither out of University of Minnesota. Um, I guess she was at Michigan when, when this was written. I think she's at Minnesota now. But anyway, uh, Dr. Gaither uh, and, and several several uh, researchers that have been quite prolific in pharmacy administration and uh, other um, uh, uh, constructs related to uh, pharmacy management. This is in Research and Social and Administrative Pharmacy uh, from 2008. All right, for the last part of the video, we're going to talk about what managers can do. So we're not just going to talk about all the bad stuff, but what are some strategies that we can try to reduce this thing called job stress? So one, one suggestion is how do we um, increase psychological safety? So what does that mean? Your employees should never fear work or feel like the workplace is a threat to their to their safety. I know that sounds um, that sounds intuitive, but um, you know, thinking about how an employee might feel if you know they feel like when they come in they're just going to get yelled at, or they come in and they're just going to get. Um, you know, it's just going to be a negative experience for them right when they step in the door. So, like, they sh they shouldn't have that sense of fear. So, they need to have some sense of psychological safety. So, how do we do that? 
Well, one, we need to set clear goals. We've got to be clear with our employees and, and tell them what you expect of them uh, and make sure when they sign on, you know, that they know what they're getting into. And then you can actually challenge your employees, but you can do it in a non-threatening way. So people think, well, you know, you can't, you know, if there's no consequences or if they're not going to get um, disciplined for not performing well, you know, how do you how do you um, um, achieve results? Well, it's it's not that you're not challenging your employees. It's not that you're not pushing them. It's that you're doing it in a way that they know it's okay to fail from time to time. There may be things that, that they need to know that that they can trust you as a as a boss that you're not you're just going to jump on their down their throat anytime they screw up. Um, obviously, there are times when there, a screw up probably does you know, require some type of discipline or action that's got to be taken by the boss, but. But overall, like you've got to really um, create a, sen- a safe place for them. So it's not just, you know, oftentimes when we think about work, work, uh, safe workplaces. We think, you know, physical violence or, um, uh, uh, you know, psycho- uh, you know, no psychological abuse or, um, you know, other other things like that or sexual harassment. Those are obvious. Those are the ones that you know we 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 spend a lot of time talking about. But what about those little? little things, you know, those little subtle, subtle remarks that, that make your employees feel just bad about their themselves or their work. So, um, you know, can you, as a manager, find a way to, to make sure your employees, you know, feel, uh, feel some sense of safety in the sense that, that, that they're doing, they're doing okay. And, you know, if they, if they are doing okay, are you doing a good job telling them that they're doing okay or doing good? Now, can you set some boundaries for work versus non-work time? So setting some type of real, realistic expectation for employees around, you know, whether it's electronic communication like emails or taking work calls, you know, can they have a period of time where there's non-work time? Now, we think about sometimes uh, pharmacists, physicians, clinicians, they take uh, on, their, on, they go on call, right? You know, you take the pager or, you, or, your, or your cell phone and uh, or there's, you're the person that's going to be called 24 hours a, a day. Well, that certainly happens in a lot of cases, but it's not seven days a week or it's not typically all, you're not on call typically all the time. Like you rotate and so you know during that period of time you're set to be on call and you're needed. With that said, um, you know that there's times that you're not on call. So if you have a period of time where you're not on call and you're not working, you know, can you truly unplug? And and I think employees need to have that that period where they know non-work time exists. Uh, and again, we talked about the study earlier where it also impacts the significant others of employees, the family. So obviously, because you're intruding on non-work time. And really, you can't make your employees feel guilty for not working. You know, if you've set clear boundaries, and from time to time we violate these boundaries. From time to time we have an urgent deadline that just just so happens we got to get some work done on a Saturday or Sunday. Uh, I'm actually recording this video on a Saturday, um, so obviously we violate our non-work time from time to time. But I think it's important that you um, you know you set those clear expectations and you only violate if you if you have to violate the time. It really should be urgent, and the employee should also understand that it's urgent. And then you know after you've violated that non-work time, I think it's good to apologize to your employees. Like say say I'm sorry. Say guys, you know this wasn't uh, wasn't something that we want to do on a regular basis. Uh, so so just kind of being clear about it. And that sort of gets into the next recommendation is uh, transparency. You know, employees should not be confused about how their work connects to a company goal. So if they understand something is urgent and they understand why it's urgent, I think a lot of employees are going to be quick to helping you out. Um, you know, one of my earliest experiences as a, man, as a manager for a long-term care pharmacy company, um, I had periods of time where I had a lot of employees working overtime, but I never mandated overtime because my employees, in a lot of cases, they knew when we had a, an urgent situation come up that we needed help, and many of them volunteered to help. It wasn't, and it wasn't just to get the time and a half overtime pay or whatever that you know. I'm sure that helped in some cases, but believe me, at that time it was a pretty stressful urgent situation and, and no one wants to work in that sense of urgency for, for long, but, um, but by employees connecting the dots and knowing that, um, you know, knowing that something's got to get done, 
many of them will, will, will jump in and sacrifice. Um, so especially if they know the big the, the bigger picture. If they don't see the big picture, it's your job as the manager or leader to help them see the big picture. So thinking about when you engage your employees and trying to do it authentically, how do you motivate them beyond a paycheck? How do you help them connect the daily, the, the daily tedious task, right? Maybe the you know, the reports that you're writing or the, uh, I don't know, like the, just whatever your daily kind of things are, checking email, you know, whatever it may be. What are those daily tasks? How do they connect to the real world? How does it connect to the impact that they're having on the company, your customers, uh, your patients? You know, how, how do they see the impact or do they see the impact? And it's got to be authentic. I think if you, um, you know, if you're engaging or trying to engage employees and motivate your team, but it's not really, they don't see it, sense it from you as being real. I, I think they'll see through that right away. So, so, and we'll talk about leadership authenticity in another video. But um, I want to make sure I touch on it here that in, in employee engagement uh, can't be fake. And the moment it's fake, it, it backfires. All right, so that ends uh, this lecture on job stress. And uh, if you have any questions, you can email me. Uh, you can also connect with me via Twitter if it's uh, something that uh, could be good for a general public discussion. And, uh, and if you're watching this on YouTube and uh, you're not enrolled in our class, you could uh, comment down below. Obviously, uh, uh, students in the class can certainly comment um, via Blackboard uh, as well as uh, email me if you have any additional questions. All right, thank you.